Hey there, students. Welcome to Modern World History. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be discussing absolute monarchs in Europe. Uh, take a quick look at the learning targets. It says, explain the source of power of the absolute monarchs. Okay, so we're going to talk about something called divine right theory. And then we'll also discuss some of the uh, absolute or the features of absolute monarchs. And then we'll move into France. Okay, so the primary focus will be Louis XIV. Uh, but there'll be some people along the way that kind of contributed uh, to his um, absolute power. All right, before we get started though, I wanted to do a little bit of uh, background. Okay, so um, we've discussed earlier in this course, earlier in the semester, two specific time periods. We talked about uh, the Middle Ages, and then we talked about the Protestant Reformation. Okay, first the Middle Ages. Uh, during that time period, uh, we had a situation where power was sort of divided uh, throughout Europe. So within each individual country, for the most part, uh, power was divided among three classes, three groups. Okay, So the first was the monarchy, um, and then the second would be the nobility, and they were the large land landowners throughout a country. And then the other institution was the Catholic Church. So each one of those uh, groups uh, sort of wielded a certain amount of power. And what that means is they had decision-making uh, authority, okay? Uh, when we talk about the monarchs, um, they were uh, weak, okay? They were a little bit more than what we would call figureheads, but they didn't wield large amounts of power, and oftentimes they had to... Um, sort of govern uh, with the other two groups, but especially the nobility, okay? So during the Middle Ages, um, what was common was lots of warfare uh, among the nobles, okay? And so what that meant for individual countries uh, was a lot of like civil war and uh, unrest and chaos and anarchy and things like that. A lot of bloodshed, and that bloodshed all oftentimes extended to the civilian population. Okay. Um, all right. The next uh, period that is noteworthy uh, to mention was, as I said, the Protestant Reformation. And so we talked about that, uh, how Martin Luther and then others uh, decided to break away from the Catholic Church. And what that meant was that the Catholic Church lost power. Okay lost power and influence, okay? So what ended up happening is uh, that power that was lost um, by the Catholic Church, we're gonna see in certain instances, was sort of absorbed by the monarchs, okay? And so that's really what the term absolutism is about, is about the rise uh, of power and status of certain European monarchs, okay? So that was, sort of uh, something you know that's important for background information or background understanding. All right, next slide. All right, so when we talk about um, absolutism, what it really means is it's a type of government where monarchs have total control over their country. They have what's called sovereignty, all right? And where, um, or what exactly does sovereignty mean? It means that they have the ability to make laws, okay? They have the ability to direct the um, military. Um, they have the right to collect taxes as they see fit. And what else? Oh yeah, um, if if you, they, they have the right to imprison people, okay? Wh whether that person or people um, broke any laws, okay? Uh, so they sort of supersede the power of law, okay? That means that their authority is greater than law. So that means they don't have to follow follow the law. They're above the law, all right? And then uh, because they control the military, there's really no one who can, uh, no one group that can stand against them. There's no one group that can um, overthrow them or limit their power, okay? So uh, the power is in their hands and they basically answer uh, to no one. All right. What's interesting um, to note is that during this time, there was one group 
uh, that decided to sort of join forces uh, with monarchs. And this is just all sort of big picture. Um, when we kind of zero in on certain countries, it's not always this case, but it, it usually is. All right, so the one group that tended to um, work alongside the, the monarchs, these absolute monarchs, was uh, the middle class, okay? Um, go back a little bit, we talked about overseas exploration um, and how uh, Portugal and then Spain and then soon other countries uh, began uh, exploring the, the world beyond the European borders to establish trade and then ultimately uh, establish colonies. And so what that does is it not only makes the country wealthy, but it makes individuals wealthy. Okay. And so there was a rise uh, of a merchant class. Okay. And we talked about that uh, when we discussed the uh, Renaissance and that the Renaissance began in Italy. Why? Because there was this merchant class that grew this, you know, that grew very wealthy, all right? Uh, and so this growing middle class of merchants, bankers, and let's say lawyers um, saw fit to forge uh, an alliance with the absolute monarchs, why? Because um, for them, their number one motivation was to conduct business so that they can make money. All right, and because they wanted to make money, they sort of required a situation where there was law and order, okay? And so for them, it seemed like a good idea to kind of go along with an absolute monarch because that is exactly what that king or monarch could do. He could provide um, the stability, uh, the law and order that was necessary to conduct business, okay? And especially, um, when you consider the alternative, um, when the nobles had a lot of power and the kings were weak, they often fought each other. And as I said, there was lots of civil war and unrest and anarchy, and that certainly isn't good for business. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, and um, as we move on, um, I, hopefully that will sort of um, kind of get solidified in your head. All right, so this there's a question about uh, features of absolutism. All right, so what are some of the key things that most absolute monarchs have? And we're going to go through that. All right, so the first thing is that they have these bureaucracies. They have these governmental agencies that help them run the state, okay? Now, typically, previously, before we had absolute monarchs, um, they were very dependent upon the nobility. And oftentimes, the nobles would work within the governmental agencies uh, for the king, all right, and help him administer his state. Uh, but during, you know, starting around in the 1500s, that began to change. And um, kings began to appoint uh, bureaucrats who were from the middle class. So attorneys, merchants, and bankers, as it says in the notes, all right? And so their job was to help kind of administer uh, the state. And the primary function that the kings had for their bureaucrats to do was to raise revenue through tax collection, okay? And you'll see in just a moment why that was so important, all right? Now, I just wanna take a break for a second and, and kind of talk about the nobility, all right? So it, it, it wasn't uh, a situation in Europe where uh, the kings sort of defeated the nobility, uh, by going to war with them or anything like that, because the nobles were still very uh, powerful, especially if they were to join forces. So that wasn't a situation where kings were too eager to kind of um, create uh, any kind of you know conflict with their with their nobles. So what they tried to do for the most part is ignore them. And what I mean by that is. Uh, they allowed the nobles to remain tax exempt. Uh, and that way they could sort of justify leaving them out of certain decisions that were, are, uh, that were you know, going to be made in the government, especially with their new middle-class bureaucrats. Okay, so does that make sense? So instead of uh, relying on the nobles, uh, they, they don't like get rid of the nobles entirely. They just sort of kind of push them to the side. And, and what more or less pacifies them is that they don't have to pay taxes. Okay, so they kind of do their own thing while uh, the 
uh, uh, the monarchs sort of consolidate their power, okay? So as I said, collecting taxes was the number one function uh, of those bureaucrats, okay? And why? Why? Well, because they needed to uh, build permanent standing armies and they were very expensive. Okay, so if the nobles were ever to resist the king, he could truly demonstrate his power or his sovereignty through a very large army, okay? And permanent means it's not temporary, it's not, you know, uh, like during the Middle Ages, especially during the Hundred Years' Wars, uh, the the soldiers would, would serve for a period of time and then go home. Um, this was something that was much more expensive, okay? And so they relied heavily on taxation uh, in order to do that, all right? Um, not only that, not only to, you know, defeat any potential uprisings by nobles or any other group, but also to defeat other countries should they uh, want to invade or declare war on them. Um, and then finally, uh, something called secret police, okay? So secret police agencies were created to investigate and punish enemies of the crown, and, and these enemies could be small or large, but um, typically, you know, it would be within the noble class. And so by using informants, they were able to kind of keep um, abreast of what might be going on with their nobles, and they might be able to potentially sniff out any uh, would-be, you know, uprisings, okay? And so then they could punish them and uh, eliminate them as a threat, so... All right, secret police. So not to be confused, the last bullet point says with 20th century totalitarian leaders who used the secret police uh, a lot more um, and they had uh, a tremendous, they had a lot more control over the lives of the individual citizens. So when I say that 20th century totalitarian leaders, we're talking about um, Mussolini in Italy um, to a lesser degree, but but definitely uh, Adolf Hitler in Germany and Nazi Germany, and then Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union. All right, so the secret police wasn't quite to that level, um, but it's, you know, I guess uh, the starts of it. Okay, so where does the authority uh, to govern come from? Where does the power come from? Where does the right to possess all of this awesome power come from? Um, well, if we go back to the Middle Ages, what determined um, power, what determined status was your social class. And your social class um, was definitely tied to whether or not you possessed land, okay? So those people who possessed land oftentimes had tremendous amount of influence, okay? As I said, things kind of change and evolve and eventually uh, the power and influence begins to consolidate in the hands of a monarch. Where does he get off? Where does he have the right, or she for that matter, where do they have the right to, to make all of the decisions? Well, it's based on divine right theory, okay? And this bishop, Jacques Bousset, who was a Frenchman, um, was one of many who sort of kind of articulated where that authority came from. And as the, the vocab term might indicate, it comes from God, all right? And where do we find God's word? You look to the scriptures, you look to the Bible, all right? And so there, there are several examples within the Bible that talks about the, the uh, responsibility <clears throat> that leaders have, worldly leaders have in sort of maintaining control and providing order uh, for their citizenry. And therefore the subjects have to remain loyal and sort of listen to them, okay? And so uh, this was just a reiteration of what the Bible had said. And so this sort of gives uh, these monarchs a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit more authority um, and, by being able to point to the Bible, all right? So their authority uh, was was absolute and came from God, okay? So can't argue with that, at least at this time. Uh, it might be worth mentioning, here's a quote by Bishop Gousway, and, and I encourage you to read it, um, but it, it, it more or less says what I just got done saying, um, but there, there's one other part that I that I forgot to mention, and that is, Okay, so these kings have an awesome amount of power, but with that power comes a lot of 
sort of responsibility, okay? And so it, it doesn't mean that a king, just because he possesses all this power, that he can do whatever he wants. Um, he has to govern in a very just and humane way. And, um, you know, the Bible is clear there as well that if he doesn't, he's going to suffer God's wrath, all right? And so just a little hint, that's kind of what the uh, caption that you see before you is talking about, okay? All right, moving on. So we're going to talk about this uh, this French uh, official, this um, clergyman. His name is Cardinal uh, Richelieu, and he's going to play a very prominent role in, in France's history. Okay, so we pick up talking uh, about France in 1624, all right? Well, the last time we talked about France or Europe, for that matter, in large um detail was sort of at the tail end of the 1500s, okay? So there was a lot of things that happened in between these two, you know, in between these two time periods, okay? So the last, we talked about Europe, um, there was the Protestant Reformation, uh, European countries were expanding their, their boundaries by, by going overseas and establishing colonies. Um, but there was a lot of uh, religious problems. There was a lot of uh, religious unrest. And there was also some issues with nobles um, kind of using religion as a way to uh, wrestle power away from the kings. Okay, so we saw a little bit of that conflict uh, when we talked about Martin Luther um, and the, the Holy Roman Emperor uh, Charles V, or Chucky V as I like to refer to him as. There was some religious conflict in the Holy Roman Empire. Well, that religious conflict also uh, took place in France. Okay, there was a uh, group of uh, French Protestants. Uh, they were Calvinists, followers of John Calvin. They called themselves Huguenots. Um, they, uh, Protestantism spread to a, a large percentage of the uh, French nobles. And uh, before long, uh, they were at war with uh, the crown. Okay, and so that period of history, um, really from, I mean, it was like the second half of the, it was a 36 year uh, struggle that sort of ripped France apart, um, like 1560s to the 1590s. Uh, it's called the French Wars of Religion, all right? So there was a lot of civil war, there was a lot of destruction, there was a lot of unrest, okay? And so really when the war ended, the country um, was desperate to try a different path. And the, and the path was, uh, that they were going to follow a strong leader, all right? And so that's where we pick up with Louis XIII and Cardinal Richelieu, all right? These two guys together are going to help create an absolute monarch within France um, because the alternative and the unrest and the chaos and the civil war and destruction just really wasn't, um, you know, wasn't working anymore, all right? So uh, the situation where Cardinal Richelieu kind of comes in uh, is because when Louis the th uh, 13th comes to the throne, he's just a boy, he's too young to rule on his own, and so uh, the royal family selected for him a uh, advisor, and in this case we call him regents, okay? So Cardinal Richelieu did such a go uh, good job uh, that when Louis the 13th became an adult, he kept Cardinal Richelieu on, and Richelieu was so powerful of a figure that he kind of overshadows Louis the Thirteenth. Okay, so when we talk about the reign of Louis the Thirteenth, we really mean um, Cardinal Richelieu because he's the one who makes uh, many of the key decisions. All right, so what he is able to do is to strengthen the power of the monarchy, and how does he do that? He he removes uh, the nobility uh, from the government, and uh, you know still provides uh, gives them that privilege of remaining tax exempt. But he replaces them with royal officials called intendants. And who are these royal officials? Uh, these are the uh, middle class bureaucrats that I was mentioning at the beginning. Okay. And so their job, as it's stated there, says is to collect cat, uh, taxes, recruit men for the army, serve as judges, and even police the nobility if necessary. Okay. So at the bottom it says the nobles still retain their uh, social privileges. So they're it, it, it's not as if they've been gotten rid of or they've been imprisoned or rounded up and executed. Uh, it, as I said, they've just more or less been ignored, all right? And they can remain tax exempt, which sort of seems 
to some as as kind of silly because they're the wealthiest people in Europe uh, or in France, and yet they don't have to pay any taxes. So that wouldn't exactly fly today or really shouldn't, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, uh, next question. It says, why did Louis XIV distrust the nobility? All right. Well, who's Louis XIV? Well, he's Louis XIII's son. All right. So when Louis XIII dies, he leaves uh, an heir, Louis XIV, but he's just five years old. So it's the same situation. Um, they can't allow him to rule because he's just a minor. So they pick a, uh, a regent for him. This time it's Cardinal Mazarin. Uh, and Cardinal Mazarin was not the same kind of powerful uh, figure that others respected like Cardinal Richelieu, okay? And so the nobles found an opportunity to sort of um, challenge the authority of the king and Mazarin, all right? And so there was an uprising uh, known as the Fronde, okay? And this was, this Fronde was to, you know, was an uprising intended to weaken the monarchy. Well, there was one specific event that took place during the Fronde where uh, some rebels were able to uh, breach uh, the castle walls, and uh, this forced the royal family to flee along with the, you know, uh, young Louis, all right? And evidently, this was a fairly traumatic uh, event for him because it, it, it could have resulted in his death. And so he resolved, uh, once he became an adult, and you know, ruled as king himself, that he was gonna do everything in his power uh, to, to break um, the power of the nobility, all right? So there's an old saying, and I just want you to kind of consider this when we get into this and talk about Louis XIV and the nobility. So the saying is, uh, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer, right? Okay, so there he is, Louis XIV. I talked about him a little bit uh, the other day in class, and. <laughs> I asked if uh, people knew who the band Kiss was, uh, and, uh, you know, the singer uh, of Kiss, what, what's his name? I can't remember for, for the moment. I'm getting old. Gene Simmons, there he is. All right, so kind of reminds me of Gene Simmons when I see his, uh, his portrait. But anyway, uh, so when Louis XIV uh, assumes uh, the, the, the throne, he has a very long, look at that, 1642 to 1750, 1715, all right, that's how long he reigns. So what is that? 58 plus 15 is like 73 years, okay? So long, long time. Um, when we look at Louis XIV, what I want you to um, make sure you know right off the top is that he is sort of, um, for lack of a better expression, he's the poster boy for uh, absolute monarchs. Okay. And what I mean by that is like, he is the prototypical absolute monarch. Uh, he was probably the most powerful during this time period. Um, and not only that, the way he lived, um, there's a word I want you to, um, remember and think of when you think of Louis and that's ostentatious. Uh, he lived very ostentatiously. So that means like over the top. I mean, he, he surrounded himself in just the utmost uh, of luxury, okay? And it was very expensive, and it's gonna come back to uh, bite uh, his um, successors, okay? Because it's gonna create a tremendous amount of debt along the way. But anyway, his nickname is the Sun King. So just as the sun, think of the sun as the center of our universe, or center, you know, certainly our solar system, and then we sort of orbit the sun. So it's the most prominent and most important, if you will, uh, uh, structure in our in our solar system, and and so Louis thought of himself the same way in France that he was the center uh, and the most important force uh, within France. Okay, so he he certainly subscribed to divine right theory. Um, you know, he believed his his uh, power came directly from God. All right. Uh, okay. So before we go too much further, we want to talk about uh, the wealth. Uh, that was necessary for him to w live the way that he uh, lived and also for France to become as, as powerful, it certainly had to be wealthy, okay? And so we're going to look at the, uh, the, uh, the actions of one of uh, Louis XIV's key financial advisors, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. So that's what this question is asking. So in red, you can see uh, some of the things that he did. So he... Um, 
implements a um, economic system that's based on laws or governmental policies called mercantilism. All right. And mercantilism is a type of, you know, it's a combination of governmental policy and sort of a type of uh, econ economics, all right, sort of an economic system, all right, and it's one in which the state plays a very important role. The government plays a very important role uh, in its country's economy, and and the whole the whole goal is to make the country as wealthy as possible, all right. Um, and how do you do that? Well, at this time period, uh, as I said before, lots of countries are getting involved in overseas exploration for trade, um, and then they're starting to establish colonies. Uh, in various parts of the world. So that's certainly going to be something that uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert is going to promote. And how do you do that? Uh, through shipbuilding, uh, maybe offering what are called subsidies. Uh, and what are subsidies? It's like the government giving low interest loans or even giving money to certain companies to um, you know, build ships. And then they would then go out and, you know, conduct trade and, and uh, establish colonies. But the idea is that when they made money, they would have to give a kickback in, in, the, in, the, in the form of taxation to the country so that it would become wealthy, all right? And then uh, let's talk about colonies too, all right? The whole goal is to become, under mercantilism, it's to become self-sufficient as a country. And what that means is the country can produce everything that it needs for its citizens without having to rely on any kind of trade, all right? So the idea is um, whatever the country can't produce itself because maybe it lacks raw materials, that's where colonies will come in, all right? And so by establishing colonies, you can import stuff from your colonies uh, and then use that to manufacture finished goods. And then the whole point of mercantilism is to export them, sell them to other countries. And then those countries will purchase your exports with gold, all right? And so gold will make you more powerful. It will make you wealthy, all right? So the whole idea, the end game is get as much gold as possible, all right? So a country becomes self-sufficient. The government is supporting the economic goals. Um, you know, by supporting various industries. And the whole idea is to manufacture uh, and become self-sufficient and then export as much as possible and, and make sure that people uh, pay for those goods with gold. All right. That was what Jean-Baptiste Colbert created. Other countries are going to follow that game plan, but he more he's not the first to introduce it, but he's he successfully uh, implements it in like he does it better than anyone else. All right. So Jean-Baptiste Colbert, uh, here are some of the other things that he did. Uh, he placed tariffs on imported goods so that and that's important by putting tariffs on imported goods. Uh, it makes them more expensive. And so the French people, the French citizenry will be mo more likely to buy French made goods as opposed to, let's say, English. OK. All right. I think that covers mercantilism. All right, so what is this structure right here? Uh, obviously, it's Versailles, okay? And this was uh, the personal residence of Louis XIV. Not only was it his personal residence, uh, it was a place where he expected his nobility to reside at least um, during large um, chunks of time throughout the year. Uh, it was also the seat of government, um, and it was also a structure that was designed to inspire awe, not only among uh, the king's subjects, but also like foreign visitors, like foreign dignitaries or diplomats. So when they visit Versailles, which is about 10 miles outside of Paris, they are sort of intimidated. They're sort of overawed by the wealth and power of France. And it was all uh, done purposefully, all right? That was sort of the intended uh, goal, all right? So 
Here is uh, a photograph uh, of Versailles. Uh, I've been there uh, a couple of years ago and spent, I don't know, two or three hours there. Got a quick tour of the inside. And when I mean quick, it was maybe 30 minutes. And then the rest of the time uh, was spent going through the gardens. And uh, that's what these things are. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And there are thousands and thousands of different types of, uh, you know, uh, plants and flowers and trees. And I mean, it is, these gardens are super elaborate, okay, and uh, very much over the top. And uh, there's a lot of gold uh, that was used um, throughout, you know, gold plating throughout the, uh, you know, used in the architecture, both on the exterior and the interior. Um, okay, so this very vast palace uh, required thousands of servants uh, to make it run. Um, and so just a quick statistic or a, a, a fact that I want to make sure you're aware of is that they say, what I've read about it, it that it took about 25% of all tax revenue to fund this sucker. Okay, so that means one out of every four tax dollars that came in was directly um, sent to, you know, the upkeep of Versailles, okay? And that's really expensive. I mean, that's a really 25%. Um, and, and there were certainly other uh, places in France that could have probably better used that money. Uh, and as we see, we will see soon that, as I said, this is going to come back and bite some future kings uh, because they're going to have something called the French Revolution uh, by the end of the 1700s, okay? All right, so more... Um, Another uh, photograph at a different angle of uh, the Palace of Versailles and some of the surrounding gardens. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> right here is a, uh, a very interesting description. Okay. So, as I said, uh, Louis distrusted the nobility, but um, to keep a better eye on him, uh, on them rather, he requested and more or less required their um, presence. Uh, at the Palace of Versailles. And it wasn't as if they were involved in any sort of governmental decisions. No, they were there strictly for like social gatherings, okay? And the goal was for the nobles um, to be there as much as possible and partake in all of the social events um, so that they could sort of get noticed by the king and then g gain his favor, okay? So what does that do? Well, by keeping them busy and occupied all the time, Louis was able to keep them out of trouble, okay? To keep them, to prevent them from sort of like conspiring against him. Does that make sense? All right. But also with them being there at Versailles, he keeps an eye on them too. So he knows what they're up to. All right. And he's got lots of spies and informants. So, you know, if anybody's plotting secretly to do something to them, chances are they're going to be discovered and punished. And most, you know, wouldn't uh, have can, you know, considered doing that. All right. So again, the more involved and the more present they were, and basically the more brown nosing they did of Louis, uh, they would, uh, they had the potential of being present during two times a day. It's called the, um, the leave, all right. And the leave happened in the morning and it happened at night. And that was when the king got up in the morning and when he went to bed. All right. And so only the most, um, uh, favored nobles could be present during this very intimate uh, uh, period or, you know, uh, arrangement or ritual, if you will. And uh, so what they would do is they would help the king get bathed and help him get dressed. And then the process would be repeated in reverse at night. And it seems really like weird, um, but it also, in my mind, seems pretty humiliating. Um, you know, like you have to be the king's servant. Well, why would anyone want to do that? 
you know, especially a noble. Well, it was during this time that the king would give favors. And those favors were usually like titles. And with those titles came salaries, right? Like money that they would get from the state. So basically, they were paid to kiss up to the king, all right? And for the king, I'm sure that was sort of gratifying to him because he didn't like the nobles and he liked to sort of watch them kiss up to him. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it, it, it keeps the nobles in check. And, and more importantly, it, it makes them grow dependent upon the king. All right. So they're not independent They're because to be involved in, and live at Versailles was very expensive for them. So a lot of the nobles would go broke just trying to keep up with all of these big parties and things that they had to attend all the time. And, and, and so that's why they would, um, want to partake in the, the leave all right so anyway enough about that move it on gotta wrap this up another picture of the gardens as you can see it stretches as far as the eye can see uh, lots of geometric shapes uh, used you know uh, to just kind of show off the grandeur of the, of the king this is one of the royal beds you can see it's uh, plated in gold at least parts of it they said that there were a lot of uh seek there's a lot of secret compartments and secret walkways behind the walls that the king would use to slip in and out of uh, his mistress's bedrooms he was uh believed to have been a, a great lover i guess um that's just i believe that is a chapel uh within like a like a church if you will inside the royal palace all right so Here's more of what I said, uh, or just repeating what I had said earlier. Okay, so uh, there was a lot of uh, things that were designed to kind of trip up these nobles so that if they weren't present, um, there was like certain etiquette that you had to do uh, at these social gatherings. And if somebody, for example, made a mistake, uh, because the king would frequently change the way they do things, and that was designed to trip up those nobles who didn't regular regularly attend uh the you know the social gatherings at versailles and it was all designed to embarrass them okay so uh one example was uh if you were going to enter a, a a room where the king was in you didn't you didn't knock on the door but you you scratched at it all right and and things like that might change and it was again all designed to kind of keep the the nobles in check all right uh yep we already talked about that, created a system uh, or a cycle of dependency. All right, very good. I got it. I'm feeling pretty happy here. All right, so let's start talking about, you know, some of the uh, dangers uh, associated with, you know, giving one person so much power. And that is they often go to war with other countries and they bleed their countries dry. All right, they get themselves involved in some very costly foreign wars and those wars end up making the countries in debt. So... In the long run, you know, these the absolutism is is not going to turn out to be the best form of government and countries will, you know, evolve away from it over time. All right. So um, one of the things that Louis attempted to do was expand the borders of France. And so he invaded uh, an area called the, the Spanish uh, Netherlands, uh, which is I mean, the Netherlands, which is kind of to the northeast of France and. He had a little bit of success there. And then along the common border between France and the Holy Roman Empire, he was able to carve out some more territory. Um, but um, what ended up happening is um, something happened between him and Spain. All right. And that really uh, alarmed all of the countries, uh, the more powerful ones around Europe, and they decided to stand against him. Okay. And this is really the first time we see this in European uh, history where countries join forces with each other uh, to attack or to defeat uh, another country, all right? And, and the goal of that was to maintain sort of a balance of power in Europe. And what that means is they wanted to prevent France or any other country for that matter from becoming too powerful so that they could be a threat to their neighbors, okay? So the situation that I mentioned was 
between France and Spain. So uh, to skip through a lot of the details, all right, Louis's grandson, Philip V, inherited the throne of Spain, all right? So the idea was that Louis and Philip would then merge the thrones of France and Spain together. And what that would do is create a very powerful country, right? Not only in size, but in strength as well, because both of those countries alone are large, but to be joined together, they would, it would become like a superpower, a super state. And to prevent that from happening, the other countries of Europe formed an alliance system. Okay, it was called the Grand Alliance, and here, here they are. Uh, England, Holland, uh, or the, the Netherlands, uh, Austria, and Prussia. And these two are just Germanic states within the Holy Roman Empire, sort of the biggest uh, uh, states within the Holy Roman Empire. They all joined forces, and there was a fairly lengthy um, war. It was called the War of Spanish Succession. Uh, from 1701 to 1713, and this more or less, but well, didn't quite bankrupt France, but it it uh, exhausted their treasury. Okay, so it ends with what is known as the Treaty of Utrecht, and what does the Treaty of Utrecht do? Well, it it stipulates that um, Philip V he could remain on the throne of Spain, but under no circumstances were the the thrones of those two countries, Spain and France, to be merged. Okay. And then there's some, you know, little other detail here uh, talking about the Spanish Netherlands. Uh, but that's pretty much it as far as that goes. Uh, we'll skip that. There's, it has something to do with um, this uh, Charles II, <clears throat> who had, uh, who was the king of Spain. And when he died, he didn't have an heir. And so the throne went to this Philip of Anjou, who just happened to be Louis the uh, Louis the Fourteenth uh, grandson. The reason why they think historians think that that guy Charles, who we just looked at on the last slide right there, that kind of strange-looking young man, uh, the reason why historians say uh, he was unable to have an heir to the throne was because he was infertile. And they think that the reason he was infertile uh, was because there was so much inbreeding that took place in the royal family uh, of the Habsburgs, okay? So if you just look at all of this, I mean, they're not, <laughs> they're, they're marrying each other. Uh, they're marrying each other's offsprings, okay? And that's, uh, you gotta, got to have some diversity in the gene pool, all right? And that was something that they didn't do, and so the historians think that he was probably infertile. And so that's why the throne ended up getting passed to this guy, Philip of Anjou, again, who happened to be Louis XIV's grandson. All right, let's see here. I think that's, yep, that's going to be it for that. So I appreciate you watching. Um, so that should uh, take care of everything with uh, absolutism and France, the like the evolution of absolutism that took place in France. Thanks for watching.